the Daniel Cleland Podcast. Pat, thank you so much for making the time yes. today. It's an honor and a pleasure to finally meet you in person. We've been communicating for months now. Yes, since we I have. Think, what, October or something? I've been yep. participating in your mastermind mm -hmm. and uh, been a follower of yours for longer than that. And I, I swear your, your content has made me a much better entrepreneur and given me, especially coming through the pandemic, your strategies and your mindset to get better and grow and try to figure out how to use that time to strategize was absolutely pivotal for me. So thank you so much for that. Anytime. I love hearing that. Um, so we don't have a lot of time today. You're a busy guy. Uh, so I wanted to, let's just jump right in. And I wanted to ask you my first question based on this clip from London Real that you did uh, with 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 our mutual friend Brian. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna preface this question with this clip. I'm gonna put the microphone to my sure. my phone here so everybody hears it. But the game of entrepreneurship is so ugly that if people actually knew how ugly it was up front, very few would even do it. ugly it's very lonely uh it's very frustrating it exploits you at the highest level you know you, you, you in, the, in the world of business you don't just have one or two weaknesses imagine all of a sudden one day 50 weaknesses are exposed all at the same time and everybody tells you because it's you who wants that no one wants that and imagine a game where you always have to recreate yourself or else you lose like let me put it to you this way. It's like working out, but you can't take a day off. Mm -hmm. You know how you work out, at least you got like a few days off to have your, you know, regroup and all that stuff. For the first two to five years, you know, if you if you look the other way, just because you just made a million dollars in a month and you start getting very cocky or arrogant, boom, you're wiped out. That's all it takes. It's a subtle look away to get knocked out. Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? And the answer has to be very crystal clear. It's not just because don't let the lifestyle fool you. I mean, this is, it takes a lot of work. And you have to ask yourself the question, are you really willing to go through? If yes, Chris, here's the one thing I do advise to Prime to everybody. In light of that, why would anybody want to become an entrepreneur? You, you can't see yourself doing anything else. You know, it's, 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 it's gotta be, it's gotta be like I say in it. I mean, I covered it in uh, every possible way. I'm thinking about an answer right now. He, he answered it right there. I answered it right there in the, uh, in the recording. If, you know, for me, I was an employee. I never had a like idea of becoming an entrepreneur. I got out of the military when I was in Germany, I sold, uh, I went and collected beer bottles because I wanted to get a super Nintendo because a local girl named Katarina, whose brother wanted to play Super Mario Brothers. So through getting the video game, I collected 5,000 beer bottles for the swimming pool in Erlangen, in Germany. He gave me five Fennec per, that's 249 marks, which I went and bought a new Super Nintendo in 1989, brought it back to the camp. Everybody couldn't believe the fact that I brought a Super Nintendo and he played with the Super Nintendo. I played with his sister. I was 11 years old. Literally, that's what. So I realized money's out there. You can go get the money. It's everywhere. You can make that money. That's not the tough part. So then I come to the States and I'm selling hats. I'm selling things on the side while I'm going to school. I have a 1.8 GPA. Then I go to the army. College, my uh, counselor in high school says, Ms. K says, you don't really have a lot of options to go to anywhere. You can go to community college. You can go do something like that or, uh, you know, see what else you could do. So a guy named Jesus Guerra recruits me to go to the army. And he sold me, when you have a uniform on, women like it and they're going to come to you and you're going to party and you're going to do this. Like, you know what? I'll go to the army. So I couldn't wait to leave the place. I went to the army, had a great time, got out, started selling gym memberships. And I thought I was going to be at Valley Total Fitness for 20 years. No joke. If you ask the 20-year-old Pat that got out of the military, the 21-year-old Pat that's working at Valley Total Fitness, what do you see yourself doing the next 20 years? I would have told you, I'm going to run Valley Total Fitness one day. That, that was kind of what my vision was. I'm going to be a guy that's a supervisor making 150 a year because a guy named Robbie Solomon and another guy, all these guys were making that kind of money. I said, I want to make 150. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be the best supervisor Bally's has ever seen. Right. And then they offered me a position if I was to hit a number and I hit it and they didn't keep their commitment. And they gave it to another guy named Edwin Guerra. Good guy. But the weekend assistant, the weekend manager position was given to Edwin Guerra at Hollywood off of El Centro. And they kept me at Chatsworth. And I said, Robbie, 
what happened? You were supposed to give me this promotion. I beat the guy. He was number 10. I was number eight. And I'm at a small, smaller club. He says, yeah, he's been here for six years. You've been here for nine months. I said, you can't tell me that because you just changed it now. You're, you're flip-flopping on me. That moment forced me to want to become an entrepreneur. So now I go and become an entrepreneur. Here's the tough part. First year, I uh, lose $49,000. I'm in debt. I lose my expedition. I'm driving a Ford Focus. I went from the guy that's going to all the clubs in Vegas and partying with you nonstop, you know, Dre's, after hours, all of that, to now I'm driving a Ford Focus. Who the hell am I partying with? I got nothing to my name, right? And while that took place, I had to call Robbie back to say, Robbie, I need a job. And Robbie said, what do you mean? I said, he said, I need a job. I said, I knew you were going to come back. I said, well, I need a job. And Robbie was kind enough to give me a job, except he gave me the morning manager position. You know who buys uh, memberships at four o'clock in the morning? Nobody. So I'm the morning manager position. I'm working at Bally's and I kept reading books and I kept reading books. And this guy named Jose at uh, Bally's, who was a sales manager, Jose would tell me, what are you doing reading all these books? Do you realize I make 80 grand a year? What do you think these books work? You think these self-help books work? If you got focused the first time you lost a job, look where you're back. You're at back at Bally's. The grass isn't as green as... I'm like, I'm not doing this. It's definitely not what I'm doing. So the second time around, I went to start a business. Every time it got painful, all I told myself is, do you want to go back to a place that's going to make promises that they don't keep? No. Then you have to suffer through the consequences. You made this decision. You know, when you have kids, so you lose sleep. Well, you made the decision. Nobody told you to have unprotected sex. You did it. You So you go man up and raise your kids. You got married. Hey, nobody told you to get married. Nobody put a gun to your head. It's hard to be married. Hey, you want to be a CEO starter, but hey, nobody told you, hey, you want to create content? Hey, people tell you content sucks. Nobody told you to create content. Hey, you're doing a podcast. Hey, this podcast sucks. Hey, you're creating video, gets dislikes, your commentary. I don't agree with you. Nobody told you to do it. But becoming an entrepreneur, if you can't see yourself doing anything else and you do it, then you're willing to suffer the pain and the challenges that's going to come with it. Then you go at it. Now, on the flip side of it, I will tell you this as well. As I've matured as well, and I've worked with a lot of different people and consult a lot of different people like yourself over the years, you don't have to be an entrepreneur to be successful. You don't have to be. I, I, if I had an opportunity, I consider myself a flag carrier type of guy. I can be number one, and I'm very good number one. I, I'm very good at being a number one. But I'm also very good at building people up, lifting somebody else up and helping you. Hey, you want to be a governor one day? I'm, I'm, I'm good at working with you and telling you, here, here's how we could do it. And I think this is the strategy you ought to take. Hey, you want to go out there and build a business for yourself? Here's what I, you want to be the number one realtor? Let's put some things on. I like doing that, right? So many times people, instead of wanting to become entrepreneurs, if they can find a guy that's running and you know he's different, you know she's weird, you know they have a different wiring, you know they're thinking big, you know they're not normal like everybody else, you know they have an obsessive personality. Their vision, if it's big, there's no way in the world they're going to do what they wanted to all by themselves. The guy that decided to go work with Snapchat as a CMO got a $40 million exit with his stock options. He was never, you don't even know the guy's name. He got a $40 million check. $40 million may not be billions of dollars, but it's $40 million. You may never know his name. But he's a guy that became an entrepreneur. So regardless of what it is, entrepreneur, intrapreneur, if your pain tolerance isn't there, you're probably not going to make it. And if it doesn't matter to you deeply to say, I just don't want alternative life, I want to go find out what my capacity looks like, you'll do it. If it doesn't matter to you, you won't do it. You'll give up eventually. So it's, it's almost like you got into it to be the master of your own destiny. Accountability. I, my all. story, Yes. Absolutely. And entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs or anyone who, like you said, is different, thinks different, has some kind of thing. Is that something that you're born with or is that something that is nurtured over time or something that you can cultivate if someone's listening to this and is like, okay, well, I, I'm kind of afraid of things. Yeah. I, I, I'm afraid of accountability. I'm yeah. afraid of, you know. Can you learn that or is it just, are some people just different? I got three kids, right? My middle one, he, uh, uh, he can't help himself. He always wants to fight, wrestle. You know, he's always pushing. He's got muscles. His calves are bigger than my calves, and I'm 42. He's seven years old. You see his calves, it doesn't make any sense. Two weeks ago, I took him to meet Bo Jackson. We ran it out the Dallas Cowboys Stadium, and I had him right in front of Bo. Bo and him are talking to each other, and Bo's throwing balls. And Bo's going like this to Dylan's calves. What is up with these calves you got here, right, Bo? And Dylan's like, yeah, these are my calves. My daddy says, I have your kind of legs. He says, I got big legs and big butt. 
Dylan looks like a Middle Eastern Bo Jackson. Okay, what he looks like. And he's always like wanting to do this. He's always like, you know, let's go, daddy, let's wrestle. And the other day he's like, daddy, let's wrestle. We wrestle for 15 minutes. I'm done at this point. I'm like, guy, 15 minutes is good. No, we're not stopping. You can't stop. We got to keep going. And my son is like, dad, can we read this book together? And the older one. They're like, no, I want to wrestle five more minutes. You promised. I'm like, let's go five more. We go five more minutes. At this point, I'm sweating. The guy's seven years old. Okay, it's been five minutes. Daddy, five more minutes. Five more minutes. He keeps in. 30 minutes later, I had a full-on workout with a seven-year-old kid trying to wrestle with this guy, right? I beat you this time. His face is red. His body's red, and he's going at it. He can't help himself. He's charming. He's charismatic. My oldest one is strategic. So he'll always look at how he can get what he wants. So I'll say, right now he's reading two books. And it's the longest books I've ever had him read. He's read right now at this point, probably a thousand books as a nine-year-old. And, you know, the other day we're driving in the car and I said, uh, Jennifer says, hey, babe, what is the difference between a crocodile and an alligator? I said, say, Tico, what is the difference between a crocodile and an alligator? She says, one can live in salt water and, you know, regular water and the other one can only live in salt water. I'm like, yeah, I don't know that. But he knows that, right? The answers that he gives you. So he's reading two books right now. He's reading, he's required to read Atlas Shrugged, which is about a thousand. It's the four, top 40 longest books ever written. And he's reading Fountainhead. Okay, these are the two books he's required to read. He said, Daddy, uh, I want the Joker uh, uh, outfit uh, for Halloween. You know, the one that I have, I'm too big now, I can't fit in. I said, what about it? He says, what do I need to do to get that? I said, you're going to get the joke. You finish Atlas Shrugged, you'll get the Joker outfit. Okay, what if I read both of them? I said, if you read both of them within a time period and you write a paper on it, I'm going to get you a treehouse. Now, the treehouse he's talking about is a legit treehouse. It's not a small treehouse we're talking about. But we've been talking about the treehouse for a while and they want this. So he's going to read those books. He says, um, you know what I'm doing this weekend, daddy? What's that? Do I have a timeline on when to finish this book? No. How soon do you want the treehouse and how soon do you want the Joker outfit? He says, pretty soon. It's okay. Whenever you finish it, your requirement is only 20 pages a day of any book. This book, it's different. You're going to get the Joker and you're going to get the treehouse. He says, I don't think I want to play video games this weekend and, read, and uh, play any uh, games or watch any movies. I said, why? I want to read this entire weekend because I want to finish these books. He made that decision. That's him. It's not me. I didn't tell him to do it. He chose to do that, right? Because he wants those two things. So, you know, nurture versus nature, what happens? We're all, you, you're born with a certain DNA. You know, no one knows what that DNA is. But when you're born, your mommy and daddy looked at you and they're like, there's something about this kid. My kid, my oldest, since the day he was born, he demanded respect. If you're going to criticize him, do it privately. Don't do it publicly. My middle one, since the day he was born, he wanted to compete. Okay, the guy's always been competitive and he's always been sweet. He's so sweet. He's competitive and sweet. Weird combination. My four-year-old daughter, since the day she was born, she's been demanding. She's the loudest, the most demanding, and she's very like a girly, girly, so she knows how to kind of get you, and we'll go to the beach, and she says, get this sand off of me. It's so dirty. Oh my gosh, daddy, this is too much. Pick me up. Pick me up. Hold me. Hold me. Hold me. And I have to pick her up. And my oldest just goes and lays around in dirt and wants to find ants. And my youngest, you could never force her to play in the sand. But the oldest, you can't force him to wear nice clothes. He's just like, just put a shirt on. I don't care what it is. What's the moral of the story here? Some are born with it. Some pick it up by working with the right person. And some will be forced to become an entrepreneur. But no one is going to have the same, you know, there's not going to be somebody that's going to be all three. It's, oh, guarantee we always knew this was going to happen. You're not going to know it. Everyone's life is different. Everyone's DNA is different. But sometimes if you're around the right people and you learn from the right people, you could end up being, I'm, I'm, I've interviewed Sammy DeBoer Gravano and Michael Francis. These are mobsters. Frank Collada, a lot of these guys that I've interviewed. Phil Yannetti, you know, Raph Natali, all these other guys. How did they become mobsters? You know what's the story of every single one of them? They were all around other mobsters. Phil Leonetti's uncle was Nicky Scarfo. Nicky was a big gangster in Philadelphia. Phil was around him all the time. So what if Nicky Scarfo wasn't his uncle? So a lot of, there, there's also people who are great at duplicating you. Meaning, if the father is a great baseball player, his name is Vladimir Guerrero, the son becomes a better baseball player. If the mother was a, you know, swimmer, the daughter becomes a swimmer. If the dad was a big realtor and his son becomes Jared Kushner, he's also a realtor. So there are also those where their gift is to duplicate and copy you and do it better than you did. So Kobe copied and duplicated Michael. Michael duplicated and copied David Thompson. That's a different gift that we rarely give a lot of credit to. We don't give a lot of credit to people that know how to look at you, watch all your mannerisms. They see what you're doing. They see the way you talk. They see the way you negotiate. They see the way you dress. They see the way you do things. And they mimic you so well. 
Then they take everything they learned from you and they go here. I went to the Ali Museum 14 years ago in Louisville, uh, Kentucky. If you've never been, you got to go to it. It's about a hundred thousand square foot place. And you go upstairs, there's a place where you can shadow box against Ali. And they have this one place where the place he used to train at 14 years old, they got an interview with everybody from this place. And they interview everybody. What was Ali? What was special about Ali? He says, man, Ali was famous for going to all of us and finding out what was the best, who was the best in training their health. He'd go to that person. Who's the best at jab? He would go to the person and he would only ask that person about what? How do you throw such good jabs? Who's the best at uppercuts? He'd go study that person. Who's the best in conditioning? Who's the best with, you know, jump rope? Who's the best with this? Who's the best with footwork? And he always was the one that went and duplicated and copied to people that were the best in one single area. Because no one's ever the best in all different areas, right? So what is Ali known as the greatest for? Is it desire? Is it duplication? Is it copying? What is it? There's a lot of different elements of looking at it. So my answer would be both. So... Okay, so first, it sounds like your kids would make a great team when they go into business. <laughs> they <you>. probably would. <laughs> um, so there are different people born with different DNA who have different tendencies, etc. Some people are uh, forced into entrepreneurship because they are frustrated with the status quo or, or with whatever they're doing in their lives. Um, other people see entrepreneurs and mimic them because they want to have, be, or do what they see, right? So then what role do you think uh, content like the content Valuetainment puts out? And, you know, I'm almost mimicking Valuetainment in mm -hmm. a way, mm -hmm. not, not trying to be Valuetainment, but, but trying to contribute to the world of entrepreneurial knowledge. Um, so what role do you think for example, valuetainment plays in, in coaching and conditioning and, and sparking the interest in uh, budding entrepreneurs. I think that's really what it is, though. You know, for me, uh, I, I want you to question everything. That's what I want you to question. That's really what valuetainment is all about. And I want to add a you know, flair of entertainment to it. So today's episode that went out is about taxes. So Six weeks ago, I'm doing a podcast and I have Byron Udell on and, and, uh, and uh, Adam Sosnick and we're talking about taxes. And they start talking about taxes that, you know, top line, rev, top line marginal tax rate used to be 94% under FDR. 90, I think it's 44 and 45, 1944 and 45. 94%. This is when they used to talk about the story where Reagan would only do two movies because he would make $200,000. He wouldn't do a third movie because if he did a third movie, whatever he made above it, he'd pay 90% taxes. Why would I make a movie, right? He didn't want to make the movie, which made sense. Okay. So a couple of the stats where they said, you know, the taxes, a top margin of tax was above 80% for two decades. I said, no, it wasn't. Yes, it was. So I went and looked at it. I'm like, oh my gosh, it was above 80% for 24 years. You got to be kidding me. Yes, it was. Huh? I said, guys, I'm going to go study the history of taxes. So I go and study the history of taxes. So all my research team, I tell them, get me anything and everything on taxes I want to know all about it. So I got a list and I spend four weeks just studying everything and anything I can get my hands on. When I have my additional time, I'm putting time into it. Here's what I learned. Do you know who started the IRS under what president the IRS was founded under? Abraham Lincoln. Would you have ever guessed that? I would have never guessed it. In 1862, there was civil war, right? And civil war was so, so expensive for America that Lincoln went to the people and says, listen, guys, we got to pay this money off. We don't have the money. I suggest we pay for it by, becoming, uh, by introducing income taxes. He introduced income taxes. He said the following. He says, when we raise the money to pay off the income taxes, pay off the debt, once the debt is paid off for civil war, we would get away with income taxes. So he started in 1862. Do you think income taxes ever went away under Lincoln? What do you think the answer is? The answer is yes. 10 years later, there was no more income taxes because they said, we paid it off already. We don't need to tax you anymore. So taxes went away. It was only excise and tariffs. So people don't know that. Okay, another thing you think about. Okay, when it comes down to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, property tax, how was property tax introduced? War of 1812, you know, the whole Star Spangled Banner, Madison was... Going back and forth, he wasn't happy about what's going on. They came out with property taxes. If I'm not mistaken, that's the war that Canada kicked the shit out that, of the Exactly, US. exactly. <laughs> that's the one where they brag about. They remember that yeah. one, yes. The one we burned the White House <laughs> down, man. <laughs> so guess what? That was introduced. They collected the money for War of 1812 through property taxes, right? So anyways, I'm going through and I'm studying all this stuff with taxes. And I'm sitting there saying, 
When did it come up with tax withholding system? Why did it come? Who came up with this? Who started it? Why was it? All of this stuff you look at, then you come up with a conclusion. I gave my conclusion on what I think people need to be thinking about with taxes. What does that have to do with valuetainment? Here's what it is. What I did with valuetainment is literally document to you what challenge I was facing at the time and how I overcame it. So it doesn't matter what it is. Hey, how to trust people, who to trust and who not to trust. I created a model about who to trust and who not to trust. Who to marry and how to marry. A bunch of people were asking about who to marry. I'm creating content for that. Hey, how do you create a company culture? You're just 24 ways to create company culture. I raise millions of dollars of money. How do you raise money? Here's how do you raise money. Hey, how do you fire somebody? Hire somebody. I just want, well, here's how you do. How do you hire an assistant? Here's how you hire. How do, everything that I did or I faced the challenge, if you see the content when it was created, it's a byproduct of a challenge I faced the prior 12 months. So that gave me the experience to document my journey to you on how I handled that challenge that I faced. And then, you know, uh, the views, we have nearly a half a billion views on YouTube. All of social, we probably have three and a half billion views. I'm talking Facebook, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, everything combined. So then you sit there and somebody looks and says, I relate to this. I'm going through this. I'm about to go through this. Wow, that's pretty interesting. I never thought about it this way. I never thought about it this way. And then there's impact with the hopes that somebody out there is watching and saying, I got it. I'm running with this. This makes sense. I produced the content the way I wish somebody would have taught me when I was coming up as an entrepreneur. That's all I created. Right now, I'm producing three big products that I'm working on. The three products I'm working on that I'm producing are products that I personally will use. And I will be able to sell it to you while you need those three products. Such as? It's going to come out. I'll introduce it when it comes out. We're still working on it right now. One of them I'm very excited about. But everything to me is whatever I use, I introduce to you, right? So, you know, I, I, I love hearing the stories when people come and say, Pat, you won't even believe what it did to me. And hey, I'm from Israel. I run this business. You did this. Hey, I'm in Australia. You did this. Hey, I'm in underground Iran. We watch your videos together every Thursday night. This, this. Hey, we're in Brazil. Those stories are great because I never had access to that when I was coming up. So I'm glad to hear it's making an impact on people's lives. That's a good point that you mentioned there. And one thing I've noticed about you, your content and your community, right? I've been on several of these, yep. these, these mentorship calls highly international, highly multicultural community that you have, not only on the people who follow you, but also the people on your team, right? You've mentioned publicly that, uh, that you love working with immigrants. You love working with multicultural people who have immigrated here. Why is that? I, I relate to them. I think they got a chip on their shoulder. They got a point to prove. I like working with people that have a point to prove. I just do. There's something special about working with people that have a point to prove. I remember those stories. I remember one day Mario, who's over here with me, Mario pretty much runs the whole shop here. Uh, Mario comes into my office in Granada Hills. I'm in my office. I'm doing my own thing. He comes in and says, Pat, do, do you have one minute? I'm like, yeah, my door was open. I'm like, yes, Mario, what's up? He says, let me tell you what just happened. My, my mother just lost her dry cleaners. And I'm telling you right now, she was ripped off by what some of the family did to her. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to win. I'm, they're not going to do this to me. And then I just looked at him. Five minutes, he goes up and he's crying. And I said, oh my gosh, that fire in your belly is not fake. We're going to change the world together. I like you. And Mario was 19 years old at the time. He's 34 right now. 15, 16 years ago, we're talking about, right? I said, we can do something about that. Then I see another person. We're sitting there. And he gets emotional. His mother, Jose, loses the house, the condo that he was paying for. And everybody blames him. She lost the house because of you. He's like, oh, you don't even know what I'm going to be doing. Like, there's fire right there. The challenge becomes when you're working with a lot of these folks who have a point to prove. But sometimes it's not even an immigrant. So I just want point to prove. And my odds are I find people who are immigrants have a bigger point to prove than people who were born in America. People who were born in America, they take this thing for granted. People who weren't born in America, they think this is magical. They think this is like heaven on earth and people don't realize what it is. So yes, if I were to tell you who I like to work with, anybody that has a point to prove, that is a great team player, that has specialized knowledge, that wants to be part of a team like ours, I want that person to be working with me. Who has experienced adversity. That seems like kind of a common factor. Yeah, because there. it shows you got thick skin. It's very hard to work with thin-skinned people. You got thick skin. Like, listen... Uh, uh, my son and I were talking yesterday and he's talking about, Hey, you know, the kids in school created a nickname for me. I said, what's the nickname? And he says the nickname. I said, so what do you think about it? I don't like it. I said, who gave that nickname? And he gives a guy's name. His name is uh, son, uh, uh, son, Sonny. 
I said, so w- w- does anybody give Sonny any nicknames? Yeah, they call him Sunshine. I said, really? Sunshine? I said, do they call him Sunflower? He says, no, but that's a good nickname. I said, let me ask you a question. When they call him Sunshine, how does he react? He says, he laughs at us. It doesn't bother him. I said, he's in charge. He's got power. He said, what do you mean? I said, because he laughs with you and it doesn't bother him. You go away. You don't say anything anymore. I said, he's in charge. He says, half the battle is to make sure the opposition knows that you're not bothered by what they're saying about you. If you're bothered by what they're saying about you, they're winning. You're losing. Listen, we all have that one button. You have it. I have it. He has it. Everybody has it, right? But if you can stay strong, even though people are taking shots at that hot button, whatever it is, you you get to you know be in charge of your life without letting a lot of this stuff bother you. So look, everybody's different. I will tell you everybody's different, but to 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 get your business to go to the next level and do something big with your life, you have to have thick skin. So I like working with people that have thick skin, thin skin people. When you're around people and you're walking on eggshells, it is very difficult. You sell us, oh, the way you spoke to me, I don't think you believe in me. I'm like, maybe I don't believe you. Maybe I believe in you, but I don't believe you. What do you mean? Maybe you've been saying 50 times that you really want to win big for your wife and kids. And I think you're full of shit. I don't think you want to win for them. I think you'd like to, it'd be cool, but I don't think it's a sink or swim like, oh, if it doesn't happen, I don't think it would bother you because you'd have more urgency. You'd be at the office early, at the office at 1130. And you keep telling us every single week, oh, I had stuff to do this morning. You didn't do nothing this morning. You don't have any sales. Nothing grew. Nothing changed in your life. And you're running out of your money. You mean to tell me you want to win that? I just don't believe that you even believe the words that come out of your mouth. I said, that's even worse. I said, forget about what I, whether I believe in you or not. You know what the problem is? is what's that? You don't believe in yourself. To you, it doesn't matter if your dreams don't become a reality. What do you think I can do for you? I can't do nothing for you. So Thin-skinned folks who are extremely, extremely sensitive. Now, don't get me wrong. Like editors, creative people, they're very sensitive because they're artists. And I understand it. I had to learn that the hard way. Artists, it's kind of like, uh, you know, bodybuilders. You know, one time Phil Heath said something to me. He says, Patrick, you have to know what it is to be a Mr. Olympia. So what is it? He said, imagine wearing a thong and you go up on stage and you're posing all these different poses. And everybody is sitting there judging your body. You're pretty much naked. And they're judging every part of your body. How would that feel? That's pretty tough to do that. Well, if you're too sensitive, you can't do it. You have to be able to go up there and stand half naked and let people say his abs are off. His chest is this. His biceps are small. Look at his forearms. Look at his legs. He's got chicken legs. He's got this. Requirement to do anything big with your life is to be extremely thick-skinned and I don't mind if you are sensitive because we all are sensitive to certain things in our lives, but I like those who are sensitive to certain areas that they want to do something to prove a point versus those who are sensitive to certain areas where they shut down and they hide and they get away and like, oh, this was a little bit too much pressure for me. We all have sensitivities. I prefer to work with people that have thick skin. So you know me who I am now, right? I'm almost 40 years old. I'm an entrepreneur. I've been in business for myself since 2013. My businesses have all been international. I grew up in Canada in a very simple, small town, very comfortable, very non-eventual existence. Like, um, I would consider myself to be at this point, someone who has pretty thick skin because I've handled a ton of adversity, right? The businesses that I've run, in international environments, complicated environments, multilingual environments, in Latin America where everybody's trying to rip me off, where there's corrupt governments, where events happen. You know, we work with plant medicines with ayahuasca and sometimes shit happens. Yeah. Like it's people go crazy and like, you know, like very complicated, very tough stuff. And that's who I am now, right? I used to be a huge pussy. When I grew up, you know, until I was about 25, I realized, you know, I, I did the, I did the, the standard program. I, I went to public school and high school in a small town in Canada. Everything was, you know, it was all middle class. Like we were not rich, but all middle class, everything was taken care of. Um, just like everyone I grew up with, you know, like very simple, very, very safe, very safe environment, right? went to college, did that. My, my, my dad paid for my college, you know, which I totally screwed up. I partied for four years and circled through four different programs. Didn't graduate with anything. First job I got out of college was in sales. 
I trained in technical stuff, but then I ended up getting a technical sales job, which, you know, I, I got into sales after college. I spent a couple of years after college working sales. I went from residential to commercial, then to industrial. Um, but at about 25 years old, I realized like I had never really like tw- at 25 totally safe and normal existence. Mm-hmm. And I was just looking still in at, Canada, still in Canada, yeah. living in Calgary. I, I moved from, um, from Ontario out to Calgary. I was working for a, a, an entrepreneur. I, I, uh, grew his business from Ontario out to, uh, Calgary, but here I am looking at the future from that point, And it was so predictable and so safe and so boring. It just did not interest me at all. That's when I started going to Latin America, looking for adventure, you know, and in the, in the, in the years after that, bunch of knocks and bumps around the world, spent a night in a Panamanian jail, got my nose busted, fell off a cliff in Australia, shattered my femur and my pelvis, spent 40 days in the hospital in Australia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then I got into ayahuasca and I started going on. So, you know, br- lived in Brazil for a bit, Peru, Colombia, Ecuador, all this kind of stuff. So who I am now is a person who's overcome a whole bunch of, ad- of self-inflicted adversity because I knew that, that life was way too safe and way too boring mm-hmm. without getting some adversity. Now, when I look at all these, for lack of a better term, whiny little bitches complaining about being victims about someone said something wrong to me. It's like, it drives me absolutely insane. Yeah. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. So I wanted to ask you about that because you made a tweet on April 23rd about a virus that's worse than COVID that's spreading the world right now. Victim mentality. Yeah. So what's going on with victim mentality? Uh, First of all, you got to realize that you, 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 you got a degree that toughen you up because prior to that, you were also not tough, right? So a lot of people haven't had that luxury. A lot of times we don't see that as a luxury. So when you see somebody that hasn't gone through it, you're almost like, well, let me see how, how much you can handle. I've been building salespeople for a long time. One of the first things I do is I, I see talent, then I see commitment, then I learn about your family, your upbringing, then I try to find a point that you have to prove, and I see how big you think, how you are with people, I kind of size you up. And then I test you, I challenge you, see how you respond to challenges of my challenges. I give you the instruction, what you need to be doing. Then I watch how you handle that. Then within an 18 month period, I watch because something tough is going to happen in your life. A bad breakup, relationship, loss of a loved one, setback, banks, bankruptcy, something's going to happen to you, right? And during that time, I learn who you are. And during that time, I realize: is this a long-term person to invest in? Or is this a person that comes and goes? Because sales is not an easy thing to do. Whether you do real estate, insurance, investments, whatever it is, it's a tough tough kick to be a part of. It takes about 18 months. By the way, relationship is the same way. You date somebody, you're with them for the first three months, they can't do anything wrong. Everything is perfect. Oh my gosh, you don't understand. She's the best thing I've ever met in my life. He is it, mom. I'm going to marry this guy. He's going to be great. He's like, dad, are you going to love him? And then three months goes by, six months goes by, then there's fights. Now he's pissing you off. Now she's pissing you off. Now she's getting annoyed. Now he's getting annoyed. Where were you last night? What were you doing? How come you didn't pick up my call? I called you four times. Why are you liking that person's post? I noticed who you like. Why'd you DM? Why did you put that fire? Why is there a heart? Why is there a thumbs up? Why'd you put that uh, face with the two hearts on your face? Why would you do that? Why'd you respond to this person? You know, this person sent me a screenshot of the fact that you put a heart and a DM. And what was that all about? Why are you still keeping in contact with your ex? Why are you still following your ex? All of this stuff today you got to go through, right? Especially today. Then about a year and a half later, you're like, you know what? This is actually a serious one. Let's see what we can do together. But who you date, you're not going to know for the first six months. You ain't going to know for a while. You got to kind of go through it. So, you know, when you're saying there's a lot of pansies out there, I don't disagree. Uh, I do think there's a lot of pansies out there. But I think if you ask my dad who I was when he, as a kid and you ask my sister, they'd say he was a pansy. I was a little kid when I was in Iran. I was scared. We're being bombed, all this other stuff. Then I went to Germany. My dad's not in a picture. And I'm like the only guy with my mom and my sister living with me as a 10, 11, 12 year old. Kind of got to be an older brother, but your sister's six years older than you. Your dad's not in a picture. You're forced to toughen up, right? Then you come here. You're forced to toughen up. You don't have a luxury or a choice or an option. And typically when people have the option, they almost always take the easier route. We go to movies. Nobody watches movies standing up. When's the last time you watched a two-hour movie standing up? You and I, when we go to movies, we watch the movie sitting down. Why do we watch a movie sitting down? Because that's the option. If you went to the movie theater and they said, we're a standing room only to watch this movie, what would you do? 
And you're like, if you sit down, we're going to fine you 20 bucks. Shit, I'm going to stand up for two hours. And you're like leaning on the wall. And you're like trying to change your position for two hours. You're definitely not falling asleep. But movie theaters give you the option to sit down to watch the movie. And a lot of movie theaters nowadays give you the option to lay down because it goes down. It's a recliner. And many of the theaters today, high end, give you the option to get a blanket and a pillow and order food for you. And they'll bring it to you. This is what we're going to. So it's getting easier and easier and easier, right? So if there is a simpler option and an easier option, a lazier option, people will typically lean towards that. But sometimes life tells you, yeah, you really don't have that option right now, okay? Here's where you are right now. You lost everything. What do you want to do about it? You don't have a luxury of having another option to be lazy. So that's what happened to you. The whole story in Brazil, the whole story in Australia, 30, 40 days, the whole story of, you know, knows, the whole story of falling, all, all that stuff is part of a school of hard knocks. And uh, fortunately, you know, when you're going through it, it sucks. You know it yourself. When you're in it, yeah. it is not fun. Like I got kids and I tell my uh, wife and we're talking, I told a story to, uh, uh, we're sitting having dinner at my house at Thanksgiving three years ago. And Alexis, one of the girls that's been working with, with me for 17 years, she was my personal assistant. Now she runs a whole department. I'm so proud of her, what she's done. <laughs> and um, I said, you know, guys, I got a question for you. I like to ask critical thinking questions during Thanksgiving. So listen, what do you do? If your daughter's in a relationship and her boyfriend hits her in the face, what do you do? What should you do as a dad? So I go around the table. Okay, your daughter's 17 years old. Her boyfriend, whom she loves, hits her in the face. What do you do to him? So first person says, oh, I know the wrong people. I'm going to kill him. Okay, great. What do you do? I'm going to beat the living hell out of him. What do you do? I'm going to get everybody in that place to beat the living... So everybody's going through, and I'm like, I'm giving mine. I'm like, oh, I just, I don't know, man. This, I mean, I, I, I would want to destroy this person here. And it You'd comes want to Alexis. To. Yeah. And then Alexis turns. She says, you know, I just watched a show. And I said, what show? She said, this is the show. So let me, I'm, let me show you the clip. So she brings this clip up. It's a scene where the daughter goes up, and she's late to her sister's wedding. She's one of the bridesmaids. And her and her boyfriend are fighting outside. And outside when they're fighting, the boyfriend slaps the daughter. When they come inside, one of the people whispers to the daughter's dad that your daughter's boyfriend just slapped, him in the, slapped her in the face. He comes out, he confronts him, and daughter says, daddy, don't do anything, daddy, don't do anything. The father punches the boyfriend out. He knocks out. She gets him from, how could you do that? How could you do that? And the daughter leaves with the boyfriend for two and a half years and disappears. So sometimes you're sitting there and you're looking at trying to protect everybody from challenges they need to face. You can't. Everybody has to go through it. Now, somebody may say, I would still beat the living hell out. I might totally get it for you. But maybe the daughter's reaction is going to be different. Maybe there's a different approach to it. Many people are going to have different answers. There's not a right or wrong answer. Everyone's going to respond to through emotions. What's the point? Even with having kids, our kids are going to go through some tough moments, man, where you as a parent want to be able to do everything for them and all you're doing behind closed doors, praying, praying, saying, I hope you get through this. I hope God, please strengthen. Please, God, just be with them. I hope they make the right decision. I hope they make the right decision because we hear so many of the bad stories. So at the end of the day, you know, any of the pansies out there that are listening to this, if they haven't gone through hard times yet, unfortunately, unfortunately, they're going to. You're just hoping those tough times don't come up when you're 60 years old. Because sometimes when they come up when you're 60, 70, it's too late. You don't have the same energy. I went to a concert one time with Dariush, Persian singer. And he said the most interesting thing. He said, that's funny. Alexis just literally texted me 11 minutes ago. He said, uh, uh, I want to talk to the young people in the room. And um, I'm like, okay, let's see what this guy's got to say. It's about eight years ago, seven years ago. He says, I am now an old wolf. I don't have the energy I had when I was in my 20s, 30s, 40s. All I'm asking the young people to do here is to make sure the young wolf in you takes care of the old wolf that one day you will be. He said, you have to look at yourself as a 35-year-old making the right decision today to take care of the 65-year-old that you will be one day. Yeah. And what you do today will dictate the life you'll have at 65 years old. So people have to realize if they're not having a tough right now and they don't want to get their act together, don't worry. Tough times are coming. It's going to come. Nobody leaves this place without tough times. You either right. do it earlier or you do it later, but it's coming. So, okay. One of the questions I want to ask you about, one thing that really is important to me, one thing that really bothers me on this topic is that, let's call it a weakness density. 
of society. And I see an increasing weakness density in Western society, particularly Canada and United States right now. And then I look at competing countries like, like China, you guys talk about China a lot uh, yeah. often because yeah. it is, it's, it's our primary competitor yeah. for, for world power. It's like the balance of power in the world, the, yeah. the, the world dominating ideology, the dominating currency, the dominating. There's one country that scares them, which I'll tell you here in a minute, but keep going. I'm listening. So I'm just, so when I see people here complaining about a word that somebody says, like, like treating, you know, someone says the wrong pronoun or someone says the wrong, you know, whatever, just a, an offensive word that's insensitive to somebody. And then people freak out about it and they want to cancel you. And that's like the most important thing to them is, is, is this, this word that's insensitive. And I have a sister who's way like down that rabbit hole. Right. So it's, it's very personal to me. We don't even talk. She canceled me. She, she blocked me. And like, I mean, and then you look at these other cultures like China who are tough as nails where they're organized, they're tough. They got thick skin. They are fighting to, you know, they're, they're, they're committed. They're strategic. They're committed. So how can we, I mean, are we going to lose this battle if, if we keep going down this, this path? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things you said about, by the way, a lot of people are right now being canceled. A lot of families are canceling each other. I got a guy here in the office who told me his mom and his sister don't even talk to him. And his dad asked him to change his name because him and his dad have the same exact name. His dad told him, I need you to change your last name. You can't have the same name as me because when people go Google me, I'm an executive. Your name is coming up and the stuff you talk about is not cool in my community. And everybody keeps asking me, is that your son? And I have to say, yes, can you please change your last name? A father is asking his son to change his last name. So that cancel culture is going on everywhere. Let's talk about China and US. So um, remember how I talked about the story about taxes, how I went down the rabbit hole to find out about taxes. How many military bases you think U.S. has around the world? Foreign, not domestic. How many foreign military bases you think U.S. has around the world? No idea. What do you think? Just take a wild guess. What do you think? 400? Okay, you're close. It's 800. 800 foreign military bases around the world in 71 different countries, okay? Do you know how many Russia, France, and Britain have combined? The three. 30, okay? Let me say that one more time. Russia, France, Britain combined have 30. U.S. has 800, okay, in 71 countries. Do you know how many foreign military bases China has? I want you to, I, I want to help you with this answer. Sky, you too, okay? I want to help you with this answer. There is no way you're going to get this answer right. So assume it has to be either extreme one side or the other side. I'm trying to help you with the answer. What do you think it is? Well, I mean, you've got okay. the Belt and you're Road. You're close. In, you've, you've got the Belt and Road Initiative. They've been campaigning around the world, developing yeah. and, and making a footprint military everywhere. Military bases. Military bases. I, I, I'm i certain it's to the extreme of, of, of many. It's one. Only one. You were close to it. And you know where? Here's what's crazy. They only have one military base. It's in a country called Djibouti. I know it sounds strange. It's a country <laughs> in Africa called Djibouti. It's right in the chokehold of the Suez Canal, okay? Because they get majority, 72% of their oil, they get from there. So they have to make sure we're going to get our oil no matter what. They don't have any other foreign military bases. So let me get this straight. How do you not have foreign military bases? Now, on the they flip side- They own ports everywhere. They own ports. They own infrastructure. That's all different, but not Costa military Rica. bases. But that's not military bases. So now watch what they do. They just invested $400 billion in Iran for 25 years. Who do you think owns Iran now? China. They put $14 billion in a small country, Armenia. What are you doing in Armenia? They put all this money in Africa. All of these different places, they put the money to buy they the land, the right? They own the toll roads in Costa Rica. All over the place. They build so, highways and own the tolls. So while we have 800 military bases, because we're trying to be mommy and daddy and make sure we help contribute to all these other countries, America's national debt keeps increasing, okay? We keep increasing and our taxes are going to go up. You think they're going up right now? They're going to keep going up. How the hell are we going to pay the $30 trillion of money? It's only one way. You raise taxes. It's not like the government's going to create the next Amazon and pay it off with $2 trillion. That's not their model. Their model is we got to tax you, right? They keep taxing you, taxing you, taxing you. Now, China, since they don't have the 800 military bases around the world, guess who officially has the biggest Navy in the world? China. They just passed up U.S. Biggest Navy in the world officially is China. They're beating U.S. U.S. for the longest time was ahead. Okay. China, what else did they do? Any deal that they came up with that they did with U.S., any countries, any companies they did business with, we want all your trade secrets. And they produce everything over there. 
They don't allow all the other guys to be there, but they control it themselves. Jack Ma was sitting on the board of the top university. They just got him off the board of the top university. Jack Ma, they're helping him break apart the entire company. Jack Ma said a couple comments about China. What happened to me? Got canceled. He disappeared for three months. China plays a complete different game than U.S. All that money that U.S. throws around at different military bases to try to control. Don't get me wrong. I know when Hillary Clinton and Condoleezza Rice said, if you leave Afghanistan, watch what's going to happen there. You know, Hamas, all this. Not saying all of that stuff. Hezbollah is going to come. Not saying all that stuff. I'm saying that stuff, Taliban is going to come and they're going to do what they're going to do. But 800 military bases, a little bit too much. What does China do on the flip side? They take that money and they're testing and learning on different kind of war that's going to be played today. You think war is going to be with fighter jets today? No. Cyber, bio warfare. Economic. It's, it can, it's so many different things that you're talking about. Cultural ideology. I mean, I interviewed a guy who was an economic hitman for the U.S. He was an economic hitman. You know what his job is? He goes to other countries and says, we're going to give you $10 billion. We're going to build this here. Your kids can go to the best schools, Harvard, Princeton, whatever you want your kids to go to. But in return, you have to give us X, Y, Z. And they're economic hitmen. So they go and control the economy of another country. And that's what many people do. Well, U.S. was doing that. Guess who's doing that now? China's doing that model. But there's one country that China doesn't like that scares the hell out of them, that they don't feel they can do the same thing that they're doing to U.S. U.S. is very easy. Here's why U.S. is very easy. If China wants to find out what the hell is going on in the U.S., all they have to do is watch Fox News and CNN because Fox makes fun of Democrats and CNN makes fun of who? Republicans. And so they sit there and they pin each other. And by the end of the day, they know all the dirty secrets of each other in the U.S. It's so easy for China. All you got to do is just watch them. And then what do you do? Send a thousand of your kids from China who are loyalists, who love China. Send them to all the best schools. They're brilliant kids. Send them to Harvard, Yale, all this stuff. And then make them become executives at what? Some of the biggest companies that we have in America, whatever those companies are. Facebook, Google, you to pick them. Work with those companies, move up, get a lot of intel, give it back to us. You're a loyalist to our country. Phenomenal. This is great. Now, you're not doing espionage. You're not doing anything illegal. There's nothing about that that's illegal. I just, a person's working for China. They're sending the intel back to them. So China's strategic move on what they're doing is unbelievable. There's one country that's not bound down to China. This country canceled 100 apps. They banned 100 apps, including TikTok. This is a country that has the same amount of population roughly as China, and that's India. India. India has natural resources. India's uh, population is very young. China's population is getting older. India's population is very innovative. They have a great university called IIT. Many people say IIT is better than MIT. They produce better engineers. People around the world are hiring Indian engineers. They're producing some really brilliant minds. They're starting to create these new billionaires, these new things that they're doing. They have a Bollywood. They have their own media. They have all of that stuff in place, and they're not scared of China. So China is trying and to- And they're U.S. allies. That's, they that's, love the, that's the, US. the kicker. They, that's right. They love the U.S. And the current PM is a big capitalist, Modi. So China's game is long-term. They're not playing five years. They're not playing four-year terms, eight-year terms, any of that stuff. They're playing long-term. And they don't think America plays that way. They think America, the biggest enemy America has is in China. The biggest America has isn't Russia. It's not Putin. It's not Jeep. It's not any of that stuff. The biggest enemy America has is America, period. They have completely forgotten about how incredible of a country this is. They've completely forgotten about it. So this is why when you look at what happened on 9-11, 9-11 united America. When 9-11 happened in New York, people were like, dude, I don't care if you're a Republican. Where's your kid? Can't find him. I'm going to help you. Let's go. I'm a Democrat. Dude, I don't care if you're a Democrat. Where's your wife? I can't find her. She's at work. Let's go find him. Hey, guys, let's go help out. It's our neighbors. Nobody cared where you voted. Nobody cared if you're Bush or John Kerry. Nobody cared about. They're just like, let's go find out how we can help each other out, right? The weird thing about COVID is that's not what COVID did to America. With COVID, it wasn't, who cares if you're a Democrat or Republican? Let me help you. COVID became all about politics. If you wore masks, you're a Democrat. If you didn't wear masks, you're a Republican. If you did one of these things, you're a Democrat. If you did this, you're independent. If you shook hands, you're a Republican. It's like, like people are like, what the hell do I do right now if I'm talking to people? It became so politicized. And unfortunately, rather than looking at COVID to bring us together, COVID divided us even more through the help of media. So I think uh, as much as we ought to worry about China, as much as we ought to worry about China, as much as we ought to worry about Russia and all these other places, America needs to really worry about themselves. They're probably going to be the ones that's going to hurt themselves long term. So uh, your time uh, short here, you're, we're basically hitting time here. If you got time for one last question, just as a, as in your opinion, what can us as a as a culture 
who want to lead the world and continue to uh, to spread positive values and democracy and capitalism. What what is our next move? What are our next five moves? If you <laughs> for for us to maintain what we have, yeah, here? yeah, exactly. You know, in 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 the face of in the face yeah. of our competition yeah. with 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 competing forces. Uh, first of all, I think you have to know that if you look at the mistake Democrats and Republicans made, so let's kind of look at what the Democrats did right and what they did wrong. Okay, what did Democrats do? So imagine you're a Republican, Democrat, they're all sitting at the table, independent libertarian, they're all sitting at the table. Okay, everybody's trying to encourage their way of thinking. You can put socialist, capitalist, Marxist, everybody sitting at the table. Everybody has an agenda, right, on what they want to do. Republicans and capitalists said, let's just go own businesses and let's own real estate. That's what we're going to do. I say we go own real estate and let's own a lot of businesses. And just leave us alone. We're just going to go make money. Don't tell us what to do. Let us make our money and don't bother us. That's what Republicans did. Okay. Democrats said, <laughs> okay, that's yours. We don't care. How about we go own university professors? What if we go and get this way of thinking of capitalists and rich people are bad, we can start early. What if we start in elementary school? What if we go to junior high school? And, and what if we go to high school? And what if we go to colleges? Okay, so what happens today? Out of 13 professors in school, 12 of them are Democrats, one is a Republican. So they have a monopoly there, 12 to one, okay? What else are we going to do? Uh, listen, man, like I got to tell you, this, 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 this thing with radio was very powerful. And, and, and whoever had control with radio was big. And then now it's TV. I, I say we go buy as much as we can with media and TV. Okay, what do you want to do? It's buy up everything. ABC, CBS, NBC, MSNBC, CNN. What do you want to say? They own everything on the left. What's the only one that's right, left that's on the right? And it's Fox. And Fox right now after... The two sons that are left, they're not Republicans, they're Democrats. So Fox is also going to go the other way. And who bought Fox? Who owns Fox? Where's Fox? So then they bought Time Magazine, left. Fortune Magazine, left. You know who just bought Forbes? You know Forbes that was a fiscally right magazine that China? supported- China bought 95% of Forbes. Steve Forbes. Steve Forbes sold yes. to China. He, they only own 5%. The Forbes family only owns 5%. China owns 95%. Think about that. So go look at Forbes magazine articles today and go five years ago. Read the difference. It's not even the same. Complete different language on what you see with Forbes. New York Times, left. LA Times, left. Washington Post, Bezos. You want me to keep going? I mean, I, I can tell you, everyone had, So one bought businesses. The other one bought universities and media. Guess who's winning today? It's that simple. So the strategy to make sure the next 20, 30, 40 years, this doesn't continue, is there needs to be a fight against it. There needs to be a fight on the education side. There needs to be a fight on the media side. There needs to be a fight. And, and by the way, and I don't mean from the rumble side. I don't mean from, you know, uh, let's go create social media side that's only Republican. No, because I'm an independent, so you would lose me. What I like, I like a great debate. Yesterday on the podcast, you know what we did? One guy on the podcast just started commenting, super chat. I'm from Palestine. This is unfair. You, I cannot believe you guys are single saying I'm a Muslim and you, we need to cover this. And another guy from Israel says, I'm from Israel. I lived there for 35 years. I was in the Israeli army for eight years and all this stuff they're talking about. It's a bunch of lies. I said, hey, Steve, hey, Anas, both of you guys, text me your phone number. They text me the phone number. I call them up. I said, hey, are you guys, can you guys have an amicable conversation together live while we listen to this? Yes, on the podcast. I had them on and they talked to each other for 20 minutes, respectfully. The audience couldn't believe it. Steve gave a $1,000 super chat on the podcast. Anas gave $20 on super chat. I said, I'm going to give you 10 times what you gave me. I give Steve $1,000 back on super chat. I sent him $1,000 and I give Anas $200 back for being respectful and talking to one another. Why? Because I learn from a debate. That's how I learn. I don't learn from you and I agree on everything we're talking about. Right now, the audience is listening to this. I'm giving my views. You're giving your views. We're going back. You're asking me questions, and maybe some of them are tough questions where I'm giving my answer, and they're saying, I agree, I disagree. If you agree, put thumbs up. If you disagree, put thumbs down. That's exactly what we need. But some of these universities, if 90% of the kids believe in the same exact thing, nobody's learning. So I'm not about, let's just create a platform for only Democrats. Let's just create a platform for only Republicans. No, I'm for, let's create a platform. Everybody's welcome. Let's hash it out. Debate, argue, fight. Argue. Let's not fight physically. Let's have a good debate. Let's go. Let's go through it. Talk about it. 
And they're like, oh man, that guy makes sense. That argument makes sense. Never thought about it that way before. Wow, I never saw atheism like that. Agnostic, Christianity, Jehovah, Baha'i. I didn't even know how the Baha'i worked this way. Huh, Scientology. That one thing they said about Scientology, I thought it was weird. But that other thing they said about Scientology, that was actually pretty accurate. I like that. They go, what's this guy saying? Married, you should get married. This other person says, stay single. Both of them made a great point. Have kids, don't have kids. Huh, save money, don't save money. Huh, real estate insurance. Huh, well, Bitcoin, like we need that. And if we don't create that kind of an environment where debate is taking place, uh, forget about Democrats, Republicans, everybody's screwed. And not just, not just Republicans are screwed. So uh, capitalists have been a little bit afraid lately because every time they stand up and they give their opinions, they get trashed, they get smashed, they get canceled, they get censored. We've had a lot of videos taken down, not because I'm sitting there saying, yeah, this is what it is. It's just because I brought somebody, asked questions, they give their opinions, YouTube didn't like it, they took it down. I think we need to leave that. The only stuff that needs to be taken off is, I get it, it's a public side. You can't keep porn on, although some porn stays on. You can't say, hey, let's go take down the following people. You can't do that. You can't use it as a way to create a war or fight. But I think everything else would debate. I think we need, God knows, we need more debate today than ever before. Just debate. We just need debate. Respectful debate is what we need from both sides who have done a lot of research. If we get platforms that do that, we win. Straight from the source, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, man. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. You I really it, appreciate it. And I want to honor you for what you do in uh, helping to cultivate independent thinkers, critical thinkers, independent people, entrepreneurs, leaders. We're a minority, man. We're a minority in I society. Agree. And, and, agree. and we're up against the majority that's being coached by the yep. government to blame us, to take from us, to trust the government and and rely on the government to solve their problems. So, you know, uh, you're fighting the good fight. I want to honor you for that. Really appreciate your time, man. My man, appreciate Everything you. you yes, thanks for coming out, man. This was great. Thank well, you. Cool. Listo. The Daniel Cleland Podcast. Thank you so much, my friends, for checking out the Daniel Cleland Podcast. We love you and appreciate you. If you liked what you saw, please like, subscribe, share it up with your friends and loved ones who might benefit from these episodes. And if you'd like to check out more episodes, we've got some links conveniently placed over there. So check it out, share it up. And until next time, be well, much love to you. Thank you so much.